Okay, so now that Odysseus has his prophecy, the whole reason he went to the underworld was to talk to Tiresias. He has that. He looks around and he sees all of these other ghosts who are trying to sip the blood that he has in that uh, pit. Kind of gross. But one of the ghosts he sees is his mother. And he's kind of, you know, surprised. Like, what are you doing here? So um, we're going to read that. And then um, I want to read about Agamemnon and a couple other famous ghosts. So he sees his mom, and I'm going to start right at the top here, moving to sip the black blood as mom comes in. And then she knew me and called out sorrowfully to me, Child, how could you cross alive into this gloom at the world's end? No sight for living eyes. Great currents run between, desolate waters, the ocean first, where no man goes a journey without ship's timber under him. Say now, is it from Troy, still wandering after years, that you come here with ship and company? Have you not gone at all to Ithaca? Have you not seen your lady in your hall? <laughs> right, Mom. No, Mom, I haven't been home yet. Right? So she sees Odysseus. She's like, how are you not home? She put these questions, and I answered her, Mother, I came here driven to the land of death, in want of prophecy from Tiresias' shade. Nor have I yet coasted Achaea's hills. Remember, Achaea is Ithaca, or Greece. Nor touched my own land, but have had hard roving since first I joined Lord Agamemnon's host by sea for Ilion, the wild horse country, to fight the men of Troy. But come now, tell me this, and tell me clearly, what was the bane that pinned you down in death? Some ravaging long illness, or mild arrows of flying down one day from Artemis? Tell me of father, tell me of the son I left behind me. Have they still my place, my honors, or have other men assumed them? Do they not say that I shall come no more? And, and tell me of my wife, how runs her thought? Still with her child, still keeping our domains, or gulp? Bride again to the best of the Achaeans. Um, this is a handy way to get news from home, to talk to his dead mother. Uh, this is important information. Ha is my wife married to somebody else? How are things going at home? To this, my noble mother quickly answered, Still with her child, indeed she is, poor heart, still in your palace hall. Forlorn her nights and days go by. Her life is used up in weeping. But no man takes your honored place. Oh, at that, Odysseus has to sigh a big relief. Um, by the way, if you're going to debate who has it worse, Penelope or Odysseus, right? At least Odysseus is getting news about what's going on. Penelope has no idea what's going on with Odysseus. Telemachus is care of all your garden plots and fields and holds the public honor of a magistrate, feasting and being feasted. But your father is country-bound and comes to town no more. He owns no bedding, rugs, or fleecy mantles, but lies down winter nights among the slaves, rolled in old cloaks for cover near the embers. Or when the heat comes at the end of summer, the fallen leaves all around his vineyard plot, heaped into windrows, make his lowly bed. He lies now even so with aching heart and longs for your return while age comes on him. So I too pined away. So doom befell me. Not that the keen-eyed huntress with her shafts had marked me down and shot to kill me. Not that illness overtook me. No true illness wasting the body to undo the spirit. Only my loneliness for you, Odysseus. For your kind heart and counsel, gentle Odysseus, took my own life away. Uh, I put over here in the margins, yikes, that's some serious mom guilt, right? Basically blaming Odysseus for not, since he didn't come home, it's his fault that she died. I bit my lip, rising perplexed with longing to embrace her, and tried three times, putting my arms around her. But she went sifting through my hands, impalpable as shadows are, and wavering like a dream. That's right, you can't hug a ghost. Even 3,000 years ago, we knew you can't just hug a ghost. 
Now this embittered all the pain I bore, and I cried in the darkness, Oh, my mother, will you not stay? Be still, here in my arms. May we not, in this place of death as well, hold one another, touch with love, and taste salt tears, relief the twinge of welling tears? Or is this all hallucination sent against me by the Iron Queen Persephone to make me groan again? My noble mother answered quickly, Oh, my child, alas, most sorely tried of men, great Zeus's daughter Persephone knits no illusion for you. All mortals meet this judgment when they die. No flesh and bone are here, none bound by sinew, since the bright-hearted pyre consumed them down, the white bones long examinate to ash. Dreamlike, the soul flies insubstantial. You must crave sunlight soon. Note all things strange seen here to tell your lady in after days. So went our talk, and then other shadows came. Um, okay. Now, uh, he does end up talking to a whole bunch of other ghosts. I want to skip to Agamemnon, so I'll be right back. Okay, so if you recall, Agamemnon was um, Odysseus's war buddy during the Trojan War. They both fought for 10 years at the Trojan War. Um, they're fighting alongside Menelaus, trying to get Helen of Troy back. Uh, Agamemnon was a big deal. So when they win the Trojan War, everybody goes home. Agamemnon goes back to his house, and Odysseus is trying to get back to his house. But Odysseus, of course, is now a year and a half into trying to get home. Um, so here he is in the underworld, and he sees Agamemnon. And he's like, wait, <laughs> did you just get home from the Trojan War? What happened? So let's read. After Persephone, icy and pale, dispersed the shades of women, the soul of Agamemnon, son of Atreus, came before me, somber in the gloom, and others gathered round, all who were with him, when death and doom struck in Agethos Hall. Sipping the black blood, the tall shade perceived me and cried out sharply, breaking into tears, then tried to stretch his hands toward me, but could not. Being bereft of all the reach and power he once felt in the great torque of his arms. Gazing at him and stirred, I wept for pity and spoke across to him. O oh, son of Atreus, illustrious Lord Marshal Agamemnon, what was the doom that brought you low in death? Were you at sea, aboard ship, and Poseidon blew up a wicked squall to send you under? Or were you cattle raiding on mainland? or in a fight for some strong point, or women, when the foe hits you to your mortal hurt. But Agamemnon replied at once, Son of Laertes, Odysseus, master of landways and seaways, neither did I go down with some good ship in any gale Poseidon blew, nor die upon the mainland hurt by foes in battle. It was Agethos who designed my death, he and my heartless wife and killed me after feeding me like an ox felled at the trough. That was my miserable end. And with me, my fellows butchered, like so many swine killed for some troop or feast or wedding banquet in a great landholder's household. In your day, you have seen men in hundreds die in war, in the bloody press, or downed in single combat. But these were murders you would catch your breath at. Think of us fallen, all our throats cut, wine bowl brimming, table, tables laden on every side, while blood ran smoking over the whole floor. Um, backstory. Agamemnon comes home from the war. He's been gone for 10 years, and it turns out his wife has found another lover. So she wasn't exactly thrilled when he shows up coming home from the war and announcing that he's home. So his wife uh, and, his, and her lover then throw a feast to celebrate his return and at the feast murder Agamemnon and all of his warriors um, as they're eating. So uh, not great. 
and he has a warning for Odysseus. He says, In my extremity I heard Cassandra, Priam's daughter, piteously crying as the traitorous traitress Clytemnestra, now that's his wife, made to kill her along with me. I heaved up from the ground and got my hands around the blade, but she eluded me, nor would she close my two eyes as my soul swam to the underworld or shut my lips. There is no being more fell, more bestial than a wife in such an action. And what an action that one planned. The murder of her husband and her lord. Great God, I thought my children and my slaves at least would give me welcome. But that woman plotting a thing so low defiled herself and all her sex. All women yet to come, even those few who may be virtuous. He paused then and I answered, foul and dreadful. That was the way that Zeus, who views the wide world, vented his hatred on the son of Atreus, intrigues of women, even from the start. Myriads died by Helen's fault, and Clytemnestra plotted against you half the world away. And he at once said, let it be a warning, even to you. Indulge a woman never, and never tell her all you know. Some things a man may tell, some he should cover up. Not that I see a risk for you, Odysseus, of death at your wife's hands. Um, 3,000 years ago, you can see the misogyny showing here, right? The way they treated men and women um, completely differently is definitely showing up in this text. And we can be judgmental of that, and I think maybe we should be. But uh, here is Agamemnon saying, listen, when I got home, my wife killed me. When you get home, Odysseus, you should be careful. But your wife is probably better than mine. He continues, she is too wise, too clear-eyed, sees alternatives too well. Penelope, Icarus's daughter, that young bride whom we left behind. Think of it when we sailed off the war. The baby boy still cradled at her breast. Now he must be a grown man and a lucky one. By heaven, you'll see him yet, and he'll embrace his father with old-fashioned respect and rightly. My own lady never let me glut my eyes on my own son, but bled me to death first. One thing I will advise on second thought, stow it away and ponder it. Land your ship in secret on your island. Give no warning. The days of faithful wives is gone forever. Um, so, that's where I'm going to stop for Agamemnon. He does give Odysseus a hint, though. When you finally get home, don't just walk in and say, I'm home, like I did. It could be danger. Instead, sneak around first. Don't let anybody know you're home. Get a lay of the land. See who's still loyal to you. See if your wife is still loyal to you. Um, it'll be safer that way. Okay. Uh, we're going to skip ahead and we're going to talk or, or actually see some of the more famous ghosts and uh, then we'll get out of the underworld. So I'll be right back. Okay, so we skipped some pages and now Odysseus is starting to see um, members of the deeper recesses of the underworld and there are some echoes with kind of the medieval idea the judeo-christian idea of hell there, there being different layers and the further down you go the worse um the torments are for all of eternity so he starts to see these people who are suffering some kind of eternal torment for what they did on earth an idea that echoes through lots of different religions and um even today uh, th there's vestiges of that. So I'm going to begin right here with Orion. Um, you know the constellation Orion. And then I glimpsed Orion, the huge hunter, gripping his club studded with bronze, unbreakable, with wild beasts he had overpowered in life on lonely mountainsides, now brought to bay on fields of asphodel. And I saw Tityos, the son of Gaia, lying abandoned over nine square rods of plain. Vultures hunched above him, left and right, rifling his belly, stabbed into the liver, and he could never push them off. 
This Hulk had once committed rape of Zeus's mistress, Leto, in her glory when she crossed the open grass of Panopus toward Pytho. So you see here, he's, he violated somebody on Earth, and so now for all of eternity, he gets violated as he has these vultures just constantly pulling out of his, his intestines. And since he's dead, he can't, you know, die again. So it's just constant torment. Um, this next guy he sees, uh, we get the English word tantalizing from tantalos. Uh, so tantalizing is an English word that means tempting, and you'll see why we get that word. And then I saw Tantalos put to the torture. In a cool pond he stood, lapped round by water clear to the chin. And being a thirst, he burned to slake his dry weasoned with drink, though drink he would not ever again. For when the old man put his lips down to the sheet of water, it vanished round his feet, gulped underground, and black mud baked there in a wind from hell. Boughs, too, drooped low above him, big with fruit, pear trees, pomegranates, brilliant apples, luscious figs, and olives ripe and dark. But if he stretched his hand for one, the wind under the dark sky tossed the bough beyond him. So you can guess that Tantalo's crime in the real world was gluttony right this is a man who took whatever he wanted whenever he wanted it and so now for all of eternity as punishment if he's thirsty right he can't drink even though there's water right at his chin as soon as he tries to the water disappears when he's hungry he can't eat um even though the food's hanging right next to his face when he reaches out for it it blows right out of his reach so um there's his punishment. This next one is pretty famous. You might recognize Sisyphus from the Red Bull commercial. Then Sisyphus in torment I beheld, being roused about to a tremendous boulder. Leaning with both arms braced and legs driving, he heaved it toward a height and almost over. But then a power spun him round and sent the cruel boulder bounding again to the plain, whereon the man bent down again to toil, dripping sweat. And the dust rose overhead. Yeah. Um, another myth that's pretty famous. Homer pulls this in. Sisyphus was lazy in life. And so now for all of eternity, he has to do work that never gets done. You know, pushing a boulder up a hill. And every time it almost gets there, it rolls all the way back down. Uh, it's really a symbol for the idea of, you know, work without a payoff. Uh, you, you go to work every day, and if there's no reward in it, you just repeat it day after day, and it's a torture. Uh, he then talks to Hercules. I'm going to actually skip this conversation with Hercules. Uh, it's actually not Hercules himself. It's a, uh, what does he call it, a shade or a phantom of Hercules, because Hercules himself is now feasting amid the gods up on Mount Olympus. You know, go watch your Disney movie. But... Uh, he does talk to Hercules a little bit, and I'm going to just pick it up here at the end. Uh, Hercules, down vistas of the dead, faded from sight. But I stood fast, awaiting other great souls who perished in times past. I should have met then God-begotten Theseus and Parathus, whom both I longed to see. But first came shades in thousands, rustling in a pandemonium of whispers, blown together, and the horror took me that Persephone had brought from darker hell some Saurian's death's head. Right? He can feel, coming up from the underworld, something really, really bad. Like a demon. I whirled then, made for the ship, shouted to the crewmen to get aboard, and cast off the stern hawsers. An order soon obeyed. They took their thwarts, and the ship went leaping toward the stream of ocean, first under oars, then with a following wind, right? So we know they are going back to Circe's to bury Elpinor, the ghost they saw earlier, all right? Um, so there is an activity in Schoology where I want you to just select any of these ghosts and give a few details about what Odysseus noticed about them before he goes. All right, see ya.